Today we're going to be getting into area and the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is a big topic in calculus. Um, I've been waiting to get to this. Um, so we've been working with indefinite integrals and uh, indefinite integrals with initial conditions uh, so far. And these integrals give you answers in the forms of equations. They don't give you specific um, evaluations, though, which is what we're going to be doing. Now, but what this, what the indefinite integrals do do is they do give you positions in terms of functions, and they also help you find evaluations for specific points in time. Okay, but now I'm asking you, so from geometry, you know the area is a value that defines a size of a bounded region. So for example, rectangles, circles, they could be found using a formula. Okay, but what about when areas look like this? Okay, I have a weird area here. It's not, um, it's not looking like any type of specific uh, shape or anything. So how do I do that? Okay, so this is when we have a idea called the definite interval. So that means we're defining it from specific points. So you're going to let f be a non-negative continu and continuous on the close interval a to b. And it's important that this function is continuous on that interval because if it's not, then we're going to have holes. And the area is not going to be defined. Okay, So the area of the region bounded by the graph of f, the axis, the x-axis, and the lines a equals or uh, x equals a and x equals b is denoted by the following okay we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx now this is called the definite integral where the lower limit of integration is this a okay and the upper limit of integration is this b so those tell you your bounds okay so for example this x equals a tells me where i start and this x equals b line tells me where i end and the inside here <laughs> is this answer okay that's how we figure that out that's what that answer is okay now this is called the fundamental theorem of calculus okay so f is a non-negative and continuous on the closed interval a to b then the diff the definite integral f of a to b oh there should be a dx in here um is equal to f of b minus f a Sorry about that, guys. I'm going to put a dx here because then I wouldn't be able to evaluate it without it. Whoops. Where f is any continuous function such as f prime of x is equal to f of x for all x in a to b. Okay? Now, the guidelines for using this are the following. There's four rules. Okay? The fundamental theorem of calculus describes a way of evaluating a definite integral. It is not a procedure for finding an antiderivative. We've gone through um, how to find these antiderivatives, those integrals. Those are your rules. You're still using those. Now, this is just giving you a tool in order to uh, evaluate that integral. Okay, it gives you a tool to evaluate that integral. Okay, you're evaluating, so your answer is going to be a number. It is not a function anymore. If you're giving me a function as an answer, it is wrong. It is a number. It is a value. Okay, when applying the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's useful to use this notation. We use like a, a open bracket with the limits attached to it over here. So that way you know you're just plugging in B and then plugging in A for this here. Okay, and the fourth here is... The constant of integration is can be dropped because they're neutralized. You could think about this as we didn't know what the function was before or where it was because it was a continuum of functions. That's why we had that plus C. But now since we know we're defined, we don't need to use it anymore. And I'm going to show you why. So let's say I had this function. I have f of x is equal to um, or the integral of a to b f of x is equal to big F of x plus c from b to a. I keep forgetting to put the dx on here. My bad. Being a bad calculus teacher. Okay. Now the next thing I would end up getting is f of b plus c. And then I'll get f of a plus c. And then when I do some fancy little thing called dis distribution, I'm going to get f of a, f of b minus f of a plus c minus c. And now this is just going to turn into a big old zero. Okay. 
so we don't have to write it there. So we're going to go through some examples, uh, so that way you understand what we're going to be uh, doing. You guys are going to have a form to fill out that makes sure that you listened and kind of understood and interacted with me if you have questions. Uh, so here's an example. So we're going to evaluate the definite integral from 0 to 3 of 4x dx. Now, with my constant rule, I know I can pull this 4 out so it's easier for me to see. So that makes it look like this, okay? What I want you to do for the, for the meantime is ignore these numbers because you guys learn how to do them without, do these integrals without them. So ignore them. Think about them later. It's just an extra step to take. So I'm gonna ignore those right now. I'm gonna rewrite and then I integrate. I have one half x squared, which is the integral of here, and then it's being multiplied by the four that I pulled out, out of the integral. <laughs> Okay, and now I put this, I put 3 to 0, I'm going to simplify, I'm going to multiply 4 times four, four times 1, which is 4, and I'm going to divide, and I'm going to get 2, so you get 2x squared evaluated from 3 to 0. Now, always check your work, does this, it, does this derivative equal this integrand? Yes, it does. Bring the 2 down, 4x, 4x dx, it matches. Okay, now all I'm doing is evaluating f of 3 and f of 0. f of 3 is 3 squared is 9, 9 times 2 is 18, and 0, you put that in there, 0 squared is 0, 0 times 2 is 0, the answer is 18. Now, I want you to think about what is it that we're actually doing. We're finding the area under the curve of the line 4x from 0 to 3. So what I did was I put it into Desmos, and I actually saw that my area is a triangle. Now you all know how to find the area of a triangle. I'm sorry, my shading is really bad. My base is 3, okay, and my height is 12, okay, because my height is going to be that evaluation of where my triangle ends at 3. So 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times 12 is 30. 3 times 12 is 36. 36 divided by 2 is 18. Ta-da! Okay, so we're, I'm just showing you that it works. Showing you that it works. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a different, a different one. I have 2x dx. I bring my 2 out, so that way I just have my x and dx. I'm going to ignore the 0 and the 2, so that way I can just focus on doing this antiderivative. When I do this antiderivative, I get 1 half x squared, okay, which is the same as I got last time because of the simple power rule. Now I have a 2 that's outside. I bring it in, and then I simplify and make this into a 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1, x squared. And now what I'm doing is I'm evaluating this x squared at 2 and at 0, okay? So f of 2 is 4, f of 0 is 0, and my answer is 4. Now visually, what this would look like is my line, 2x, this is right here, okay, and then I would have two separate lines from 0 and 2, okay, where 2 would be my leg of my triangle, and then 0 would be like my stopping point. So what I would do here is I would shade this in so that way I know what I'm looking at. Now this here, I would look at base times height divided by 2. That's my area of my triangle. 0 to 2, so that's 2, okay? And then I have 2 to 4, or 0 to 4, excuse me, so I have 4. 4 times 2 is 8, 8 divided by 2 is 4, and it checks out. Now, this would be the same process if I didn't start at 0. That is something I didn't necessarily do. So, like, for example, I'm going to change my color so that way you know what I'm talking about. Um, so for example, let's say I didn't want zero, I want the one. So I would change all these to one. The evaluation wouldn't change, like nothing would change about it. I'm just changing this to one and it's gonna change my evaluation. Now visually what this would do <laughs> is move my bound, right, from zero to one. Let me erase that because that was really bad. Um, so it would move to 1, which is right here. All right, so now I'm not finding a triangle. I'm finding this, like, weird 
weird shape here, right? It's like a, it's like a cut rectangle, right? Now this is an odd shape. This would be really useful for us to have this, have this method here, right? So now the only thing that would change would be one, right? So this one would change. I would get x squared, which is one squared. This is one. So my answer here would be not four. It would be three. Okay. It would be three. And when you think about it here, each one of these squares is a half or each one of these squares is a quarter. Excuse me. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve little quarters divided by four, which is the quarters, and it gives me three. So I still have this visual that works no matter where I put my bound, if I keep my bound at zero, or if I keep my bound somewhere else, okay? So um, you guys are gonna have a form today to make sure that you've watched this video. Um, please, please, please comment, talk to me, send me emails, like ask me questions. I know this stuff is hard, I know this is weird, um, but now we have some tools to be doing some fun calculations, so, um, Please, 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 uh, hoping, hoping, hoping you have a great day. I'm hoping you guys reach out to me, um, and I'm hoping that you guys uh, find this a little easier. Okay? Have a great day.